No part of this publication may be reproduced, transmitted, transcribed, stored in a retrieval system in any form or by any means without the written permission of Prasian Media, LLC. Welcome to PMP Exam Bootcamp. A series of project management audio teachings and instruction by project management author, trainer, and coach Phil C. Akinwale. Learn key tips and tricks for your exam. This audio teaching is specifically for PMP or CAP M exam aspirants or any other PMI exam aspirants looking to better understand the PMBOK guide and project management concepts. The best way to use this series is to listen to a chapter on CD and then read the chapter in the PMBOK guide 5th edition. Also, sign up for the Prezion Media PMP Exam Prep Camp self-study online course and study Prezion Media's Project Management Essentials book, which contains problems and examples of formula-related problems and concepts not explained in the PMBOK guide, such as Earned Value Management, Critical Path, TCPI, Forecasting, Forward Passes, Backward Passes, and Organizational Theory. Remember, you have a friend and stakeholder in Prezion Media, your number one project management, training, mentoring, and coaching resource. And now, let's join Phil in the classroom. Hi, it's your friend Phil. Welcome to PMP Exam Bootcamp. In PMP Exam Bootcamp, we talk about the PMP exam and how to ace the test. However, do recognize that this MP3 series is purposely for people who have gone through a 35 contact hour boot camp or already have lots of understanding regarding the PMBOK and the ITTOs. The reason why this is a prerequisite is this is a very rapid dive into the 10 knowledge areas, the 5 process groups, and the hundreds of ITTOs. So I will be moving at a very rapid rate. People aspiring to take the CAPM exam will also find this review very useful. So if you're getting ready for the CAPM, just bear in mind that the major difference between the PMP and the CAPM exam is that the CAPM exam is based solely on the knowledge in the PMBOK guide. However, the PMP exam is based on both the PMBOK guide and other project management knowledge that may not be directly in the PMBOK guide. For example, if you read Earned Value Management, there are lots of copious formulas in the PMBOK. However, there are no problems. So the application of the knowledge in the PMBOK guide is really the big thing when it comes to the PMP. Having the knowledge is really the big thing for the CAPM. There's a difference between knowledge and the application of knowledge. And that's why those taking the PMP exam should get ready to face very long situational questions based on the material in the PMBOK guide and some material that is not in the PMBOK guide. Now, if you have read the CAPM handbook, you'll realize that chapters 1 and 2 are not in the categories of what is tested on the exam. Big shock. Well, what does that tell me for the PMP exam? Does it mean chapters 1 and 2 will not be tested as well? Who knows? What we know is that the PMP exam is based on the five process groups. And for this reason, I would like you to take a look at the PMP exam content outline, which breaks out what the exam is based on. 
basic definitions regarding projects, programs, operations, the similarities between projects and operations, new terms in the PMBOK guide, such as predictive life cycles, adaptive life cycles, agile methods, and so on. I'm not really 100% sure if those are on the exam or not. What I do know, though, is you definitely should know what those mean because you could encounter those in blended questions. By blended questions, I mean questions which have a very thorough mix of various chapters in the PMBOK guide, various concepts. You could have a question that could test you from a time and cost perspective all in one. You could have a question with answers from scope management, but the question may be in time management. So you do need to know how everything plays in, how the WBS plays in to define activities. It's a very basic example. You could have a question regarding the scope baseline and define activities. So you need to have a well-rounded view, a cohesive view of everything. I will not be going into chapters 1, 2, and 3 in this MP3 series. The reason is very clear. Pick up the PMBOK guide or pick up our book, Project Management Essentials, and read all the definitions in there. Rather than waste time reading you definitions, we might as well very rapidly hit the big ticket items that are likely to be present on the exam. To make this an even more productive study, I would recommend picking up PMP exam power sheets from Prazion Media. These power sheets will help you very rapidly tackle the information in the PMBOK guide. Again, you are expected to have gone for a 35 contact hour course or already have your contact hours to take the PMP or CAPM exam. If you do not have your contact hours, this course may not be for you. This course is a very rapid review of all the information in the PMBOK guide. If you want contact hours, I suggest visit www.praizion.com and take a look at our online solutions for learning both the PMP or CAPM material. And with that, we'll be jumping right in to the PMBOK guide. However, we'll be going through the content by process group. So we'll be starting with the initiating process group and going all the way through planning, executing, monitoring and controlling and closing in that order. So we'll be starting from develop project charter, identify stakeholders in initiating, moving into planning and going all the way down to the close procurements process in that order. 47 processes to cover and so many inputs, tools and techniques and outputs. Let's go. So we'll be reviewing the processes of project management by process group. We'll be going all the way down initiating and then planning, followed by executing, monitoring and controlling, and finally closing processes. So let's get started with the initiating process group and the develop project charter process. Our first process is develop project charter. What is the end goal of developing a project charter? To come out with a project charter, of course, right? I mean, the name kind of gives it away, doesn't it? It's about developing a project charter. So the project charter is developed with a number of inputs, a number of tools and techniques, a number of outputs. But let's talk about the first input to developing the project charter. The first input is the project statement of work. Now, the project statement of work is a narrative description of what needs to be done. Internal projects typically have a project statement of work worked on by someone internal to the company, could be the sponsor or initiator. But talking about external projects, it's coming from the customer. Our next input is the business case. The business case makes a case for the project. And that's why it's called a business case. The business case contains a cost-benefit analysis, different reasons as to why the project should be authorized. The next input is agreements. Now, this is a relatively new term as far as ITTOs go. It was not in the fourth edition. An agreement is simply an agreement between you and some other person 
could be an internal person, internal stakeholder, or external stakeholder. When we talk about agreements, agreements are used to define the initial intent or intentions of a project. It's really used to put people on the same page, and this could be letters of agreement, um, a memorandum of understanding, even plain old emails. These are examples of agreements, and these agreements help us develop the project charter. They further clarify what is in the project and what is not. Remember that old email you got from the customer right at the beginning, even before a charter was issued? Well, that could become an input to actually developing the charter. The next input is our favorite from the fourth edition, Enterprise Environmental Factors. Now, why do I call it our favorite? If you had read the fourth edition, you will remember Enterprise Environmental Factors were a recurring theme all throughout planning and other processes. So now it's kind of repeated. We have enterprise environmental factors. And the final input is organizational process assets. So those are your inputs to develop project charter. What tools and techniques do we have? The tools and techniques, one of them is pretty much the same, expert judgment. What is expert judgment? Now think about it. You're working on a project. You want to develop a project charter. A particular area of the charter might be giving you challenges. What do you do? <laughs> Try to do it all alone? No, no, no. You look for people that can help you out. You look for people who can take you from being clueless to being clued in. And I call that expert judgment. So expert judgment could come from a variety of sources. You get that expert judgment, and what do you do? You apply it. You use it. You get people who can help you apply expert judgment to developing a project charter. Now, internal projects, we may not have a rigorous project charter development process, but in other companies and even government projects, the project charter could be a big deal. And that's why you need expert judgment. Our next tool and technique is a new one. It's called facilitation techniques. Facilitation techniques. Well, as the name facilitation implies, facilitation techniques are used to facilitate the development of the project charter. And these cut across project management, things like brainstorming, conflict resolution techniques, and so on. And what is our output from this whole thing? The project charter. The project charter authorizes the project manager to apply resources to projects. What else does the project charter do, apart from identifying the project manager? It also identifies the project sponsor or initiator, typically signed by a manager external to the project and at a level that is on par with the project. So you want someone who knows about the project, who is in management, and someone whose signature on that project charter actually means a lot to the people reading it. So your project charter authorizes the project, authorizes the project manager, identifies the high-level risks, the high-level assumptions, high-level constraints, all of that high-level information needed to kick off the project. That's what your project charter is all about. And that concludes our first process, Develop Project Charter. So let's go over a few key things to note for the exam. When you study the Develop Project Charter process, observe the unique inputs. In the PMBOK guide, there are several recurring themes across the processes, across the knowledge areas and process groups. But when you are studying on the final lap, it is very important that you zero in on those unique inputs in every process. In the Develop Project Charter process, the unique inputs which do not appear in any other process are the project statement of work. You must understand that the project statement of work comes from the customer or on internal projects from the sponsor. You must also understand the next input, the business case, and what it does. What is the value of having a business case? 
It identifies why the project should be in existence. It makes a case for the project. It's a unique input here. Agreement is not a unique input in that you might find agreement in other places in the PMBOK, but it is the first place that it appears in the PMBOK. So when you think about agreement, understand that you might find it in the determine budget process, for example. You might find it in a few other places. But the key thing here is it is the first time it appears in the PMBOK. So understand that it's not just talking about contracts, but also any other type of agreement. Taking a look at the tools and techniques. Expert judgment is a recurring one. Facilitation techniques is also a recurring one. But try to understand what these facilitation techniques are at a high level so that when you see them again and again, you'll get the understanding of the broad context of these facilitation techniques. And you'll be able to relate that to the process at hand. Finally, the unique and only output of the developed project charter process is the project charter. You must understand what the project charter is in great detail. Authorizes the project, authorizes the project manager to apply resources, contains high level information about almost everything you can imagine, risks, scope, milestones, and so on. Now, a few questions for you before we round up. What is the difference between the project statement of work and a project scope statement? Two, in what ways is the project charter relevant to other processes that occur after it? In other words, ask yourself, which processes is the project charter used as an input. To answer this question properly, you need to think about the planning process group in particular, and you need to think about the triple constraint of time, cost, and scope, and the first process in those areas, plan schedule management, plan scope management, and plan cost management. You also need to think about risk management, the plan risk management process. There are other processes where the project charter is used, such as in identify stakeholders. So go through the relevant data flow diagrams and observe where the project charter is used as an input. And that concludes our review of what to expect on the exam within the develop project chart within Let's move on to our next process in the initiating process group. The next process is the identify stakeholders process. Identify stakeholders is a very important process because it's the second process in the initiating process group. And you may remember that initiating accounts for 13% of the PMP exam in particular. For that reason, we could view this as 6.5% of your exam being at stake. So it's very important to get the details. Let's talk about the process. Identify stakeholders. What do we do here? We identify our stakeholders. We want to identify anyone who could be impacted by the project. We also want to identify anyone who could impact the project. And we also want to come out with an analysis of how badly could they affect the project or how could they affect the project positively or negatively. And that's why we do a stakeholder analysis as a tool and technique. So let's talk about our inputs. Our first input is the project charter. The project charter may contain mention of some stakeholders. For example, your project sponsor is definitely a stakeholder mentioned in the project. But not just the project sponsor is mentioned in the project charter. You could have other project stakeholders. So the project charter is a relevant input. We also have procurement documents, your vendors, people who may be working on the project, subs, and so on. Procurement documents are needed to glean that information. 
We also have enterprise environmental factors and organizational process assets, as usual. Now remember, identify stakeholders happens in the initiating process group. Let's talk about our tools and techniques. Stakeholder analysis. The power interest grid is a very big one used here. If you're not familiar with that, look into it. The power influence grid, the power interest grid, and so on, which shows the level of interest, level of power, level of influence. And it shows you how to manage people closely, the kind of people to manage close, the kind of people to monitor, and the kind of people to keep informed, and so on. The next tool and technique is expert judgment. Expert judgment could come from a variety of sources. For example, your manager may know other stakeholders that you don't have included on the project just yet. You may want to get your managers involved, get other stakeholders to bring that expert judgment to tell you who else is a possible stakeholder. And how else do we do this other than meetings, our next tool and technique? So we've got three tools and techniques, stakeholder analysis, expert judgment, and meetings. Now, our output from this is the stakeholder register. Our stakeholder register contains all of the stakeholders. It may contain information about their location, their phone number, how they could impact the project, their area of interest, area of highest interest, area of highest impact, and so on. And that concludes our Identify Stakeholders process. Now, some quick tips for the exam. Identify stakeholders contains four inputs, three tools and techniques, and one output. The unique input at this point to identify stakeholders is procurement documents. Procurement documents refers to those documents associated with sellers, vendors, subcontractors, or other people working on the project through a procurement that should be considered as stakeholders. Also identify stakeholder analysis, a unique tool and technique. Know what the power interest grid is, and also know all the alternate names for the power interest grid, such as the power influence grid, or the influence impact grid, and so on. Make sure you take a look at a template and understand what this looks like in the PMBOK guide or in our book, Project Management Essentials. The unique output is the stakeholder register. Again, be sure to know what this looks like. In our book, Project Management Essentials, we have examples of these templates. Take a look, know what the fields look like in the stakeholder register, and get familiar with the whole idea about what it does for you as the project manager. I would also advise that you take a look at the data flow diagram in the PMBOK guide on page 393. Understand where the stakeholder register becomes an input. Collect requirements, plan quality management, plan communications management, Plan risk management, identify risks, plan procurement management, and plan stakeholder management. And that concludes the initiating process group. Next, we'll be going into the planning process group processes. But before you leave initiating, be sure to understand the detail. Moving on to the next process group in project management. The planning process group. This is where we develop the roadmap for where we're going and how to get there. It is such an important one. Let's talk about the inputs, tools and techniques and outputs. Welcome back. Our next process, develop project management plan. I mean, what would we do without a project management plan? Our project management plan is the roadmap. The roadmap which shows us where we're going the roadmap which shows us what we need to do to get to the end goal, which is the approved deliverable which has been transitioned to the customer. 
So let's talk about our inputs to develop project management plan. The first input we've already talked about. It's the project charter. The project charter, remember, contains a lot of high-level information, which is very important to begin to develop our project management plan. We talked about high-level constraints, risks, assumptions, and so on. And that's why the project charter is relevant here as an input. Our next input is kind of new. It's not entirely new, but it's kind of new. Before, we used to call it outputs from planning processes. But now, the PMI have made some adjustments. It's now called outputs from other processes, not outputs from planning processes anymore. And there's a reason. When you really think about it, it's a worthwhile change. Outputs from other processes. Now, what does the project management plan really consist of? It consists of subsidiary plans across all of the knowledge areas, cost management plan, schedule management plan, communications management plan, risk management plan, procurements management plan, on and on and on. You know about that. It also consists of baselines, subsidiary plans and baselines. But there's another thing that we need to take into account, and that is as you proceed through project management, through the different process groups, something happens. Something happens. We don't stay the same. What happens? We begin to move through different phases and aspects of the project. And that means that our project management plan needs to be updated. So we're going to update our project management plan. You probably remember the term project management plan updates. Well, those updates become inputs. It's like a recycle. So, outputs from other processes refers to subsidiary plans, baselines, and project management plan updates, which come throughout the project, be it in executing or in monitoring and controlling. You always have those project management plan updates. So that's a huge one, really glaring from the fourth edition that has changed. Our next input is enterprise environmental factors. And our final one is organizational process assets. Now, I don't need to dwell on that because you already know what those are. Hopefully, you read chapters one and two and you listened to chapters one and two. So those inputs are pretty much understood right now. The tools and techniques, very similar to develop project charter. The tools and techniques are expert judgment and facilitation techniques. As usual, expert judgment is used to knock the project management plan into shape. If there are things that you don't really understand about planning for cost, planning for schedule, planning for quality or risk, you're not going to just stay there in isolation. You're going to get help. You're going to get expert judgment, okay? And that's why expert judgment is relevant to developing your project management plan. And then facilitation techniques like brainstorming, maybe you even mastermind all facilitation techniques. You're trying to come to a point where you fully understand the scope of the project management plan, you're removing all the roadblocks, and you're having that interaction with team members and stakeholders to come out with a project management plan. So you use your facilitation techniques to facilitate interaction with a team to get your output. And moving on to the outputs, our only output of this process is the project management plan. Your project management plan, remember, it's a roadmap. But your project management plan is not created in isolation in projects. It's created with the team, except you're working in isolation which, for the most part, we don't as project managers. We have a team. So your project management plan should be approved by the team, should be approved by stakeholders, should be agreed on. Remember, the people carrying out the work, those are the people who should be working, chiseling all those estimates and putting all that plan in together, your schedule management plan, your cost management plan, all of that great stuff that you get from planning, all of those subsidiary plans. You're going to work with the team. And then you're going to put them all together. So let me go through a laundry list of some of the things that you need to be thinking about in this process. You need to be thinking about a cost management plan, a schedule management plan, a scope management plan, 
a cost performance baseline, a schedule baseline, your WBS, your WBS dictionary and your project scope statement. You also need to be thinking about a process improvement plan, a quality management plan, a risk management plan, a human resource plan, a communications management plan, a procurement management plan, a stakeholder management plan, and so on and so forth. And that concludes our review of the developed project management plan process. Now, key tips for the developed project management plan process on the exam. The project management plan is used in several processes throughout the PMBOK guide. It is very important for you to develop a pattern of understanding regarding where the project management plan is used. There are a few rules of thumb that will help you. First of all, understand that the project management plan is an input to the development of every subsidiary plan, which means the project management plan is an input to processes which develop a subsidiary plan, like the plan scope management process, plan schedule management, plan cost management, plan quality management, plan human resource management, and all of those similar processes in planning. There are other processes in planning which do not produce a subsidiary plan. The project management plan is not used as an input for those processes. Instead, it is the subsidiary plan that is used in those processes. Here's an example. In the cost management knowledge area, we use the project management plan for the plan cost management process. However, we do not use the project management plan as an input to the estimate costs process or the determine budget process. We use the cost management plan instead. The same thing for the scope management knowledge area. Although we use the project management plan as an input to the plan scope management process, we do not use it as an input to collect requirements or define scope. This is a key pattern to understand. You also should realize that the project management plan is not used as an input for the majority of executing processes, except in the case of the executing process that is within integration, direct and manage project work. All the other executing processes do not use the project management plan as an input. The project management plan is an input to all monitoring and controlling processes and all closing processes. You may want to revise this again and again until you understand the pattern. It will save you lots of time on the exam where such questions come up. Be sure to observe that the project charter has already been discussed, and therefore the only unique input to this process is the phrase outputs from other processes. That is a catch-all for all of the planning components that happen within the planning process group and appear as an output. All the subsidiary plans, all those baselines, 
those are some of the outputs from other processes. Also bear in mind that the project management plan is updated constantly throughout the project. Consequently, those project management plan updates are also considered as outputs from other processes, which in turn lead back in to the project management plan over time. The two tools and techniques, expert judgment and facilitation techniques, have been previously discussed. The project management plan itself is a huge one to understand and know, and therefore I would highly recommend reading page 78 in the PEMBOK guide and understanding how all the subsidiary plans and baselines play into the final project management plan. Next, we'll be moving into the project scope management knowledge area in that our next process is from there and it's called plan scope management. Let's talk about it.